live from the campus of Palm Beach State College in Lake Worth Beach, Florida. This is a WPBF 25 special presentation. Senator Marco Rubio, Congresswoman Val Demings, Decision 2022, Before You Vote, U.S. Senate Debate, made possible by Florida Press Association, these proud partners, and statewide sponsors. Now, tonight's moderator, WPBF 25 news anchor, Todd McDermott. Good evening, and welcome to our audience from around the entire state, live on television, streaming and listening on NPR Florida. This is Decision 2022. Before you vote, the U.S. Senate debate. We are live from Duncan Theater on the Lake Worth Beach campus of Palm Beach State College. Welcome to our candidates, Congresswoman Val Demings and Senator Marco Rubio. We are so appreciative for your participation tonight. Also joining me are panelists, Vicki Sachery, executive editor of Florida Trend, and Rick Christie, executive editor of the Palm Beach Post. All three of us will be asking questions of the candidates tonight. The debate rules tonight. Each candidate gets 60 seconds to answer a question and 30 seconds to answer any follow-up questions. Rebuttals are 30 seconds in length and at my discretion as your moderator. Candidates, when you see the yellow light, you have 15 seconds to finish. The red light means exactly what you think it means. And I'll, I'll remind you that it means stop. Congressman Demings, you won the coin toss earlier this week. The first question tonight goes to you. Three weeks ago tomorrow, Hurricane Ian hit Florida as one of the five most powerful storms to make landfall in the U.S. What federal action is needed starting now to protect Florida from sea levels projected to rise a foot or more in less than 30 years, while more frequent monster storms threaten our lives and livelihoods? Well, thank you so much for that question. And let me say good evening to all of you. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you to Palm Beach State College. It is an honor for me to be here. I stand on this stage as a daughter of a maid and a janitor who grew up in Florida. Had the honor of serving as the police chief in the house and now standing on this stage. I grew up in Florida, so I know all too well the devastating effects that hurricanes can cause on our state. And number one, we have got to get serious about climate change. Climate change is real. If we don't do something about it, then we're going to pay a terrible price for it. More intense stone storms like we've seen as the waters in the ocean continue to warm up, more intense storms, more flooding, more just devastation as we've seen with Ian. I've toured the area and I've toured Puerto Rico and seen what Fiona did. The federal government has got to make sure that FEMA has the resources that it needs to adequately respond, but we've got to get serious about climate change. Thank you very much. Senator Rubio, the same question as you. I'll repeat the question. Um, it was three weeks ago tomorrow, Hurricane Ian hit one of the five most powerful hurricanes to ever make landfall in our country. Federal action starting now to protect Florida against sea level rise projected up to a foot in less than 30 years while these monster storms just continue to hit us. Well, and first of all, I also want to thank the college for hosting us here tonight, all of you for being a part of it, everyone for being here in the audience. This is important. I'm glad we have a chance to do it. You ask about the hurricanes. Unfortunately, if you're in public service in Florida, you won't be here long before you're dealing with hurricanes, and we've done so consistently throughout my time in public service. And unfortunately, uh, back in 2017, we had devastating storms, 2018 as well, and now uh, the devastation and destruction that we're still calculating. I outlined last week a very specific uh, plan, obviously it's preliminary, on all the sorts of things that we're going to need help on. These communities immediately need emergency relief. What's happening for a lot of these cities and counties is they have to spend a lot of money up front. Money out of their budgets they have to spend right now to pay for these things and then they get reimbursed. And so that's why I'm very proud that in 2017 and again in 2018 I was able to get uh, uh, President Trump and the federal government to fully reimburse our counties uh, for the help they needed. But we'll have to do more. There'll be two phases. The first is emergency response, meaning all the things you need as an emergency to help these counties backfill their needs. And then there'll be the long-term recovery. And I'm very proud of the fact that I was involved deeply in all the long-term recovery efforts of the last storms as well. All right, that's time, sir. Thank you. We're gonna move on to question number two. And Senator, this question begins with you. Democrats passed the $2 trillion American Rescue Plan with no Republican support. Now inflation rates not seen in 40 years show new, no clear sign of abating. 
prices for just about everything, housing, gasoline, groceries, are way up. A Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco analysis shows injecting trillions of dollars in pandemic relief into this economy caused up to 3% of what is approaching a 9% U.S. inflation rate. And it's worse in Florida. What can you do to help families now? Well, I think the first thing we have to stop, start doing is stop spending that kind of money. We had already done two pa pandemic reliefs. This came on top of it. And they were warned. The Democrats were warned by Larry Summers, by other Democrat economists, you do this, you're going to fire up inflation. So that's number one. Number two is we've got to begin to produce American oil again. Why are we, why are we begging Saudi Arabia for oil? Why are we begging Venezuela and Iran for oil? We're producing a million barrels a day less on oil than we used to do just a couple years ago. We have the, instead, we are depleting our reserves. Our, our, our oil reserves do not exist to win midterms. They exist to help this country in an emergency or in the midst of a storm. What we cannot do is some of these crazy policies that are coming from the left that Congresswoman Demings has supported. You know, she supported a plan to put a, what is it, $10.25 tax per barrel of oil, which would have been 35 cents per gallon more for everyone listening here today. We can't do that kind of crazy stuff. It only adds to the inflation. I think it begins by winning this election and getting people like that out of office. And that's time. Congresswoman, the same question you may, you may answer, but you have 60 seconds to answer this thank question. You, thank you so much for that. Of course, the senator who has never run anything at all but his mouth would know nothing about helping people and being there for people when they are in trouble. No one planned the pandemic, but our response to it is everything. Individuals were hurting, families were hurting, businesses were hurting. We passed the CARES Act, which the senator supported. There were some problems in the CARES Act with the Paycheck Protection Program that you love to take credit for. Some say it was poorly written. Some say it didn't help the people that it was supposed to, didn't save the jobs that it was supposed to. There was a way to fix the problems in the PPP through the American Rescue Plan and help people that were in trouble. But you played politics, Senator, and you did not do that. Your number one job as a United States Senator is to protect the health, safety, and well-being of the American people. You've been at it for 24 years. Senator Rubio. Yeah, a couple things. First of all, we passed the Paycheck Protection Plan when Democrats were sitting at home in the House. They were in their pajamas doing Zoom calls, and we were in the Capitol. And we were working in the Capitol to solve real problems. The Paycheck Protection Program was a bipartisan victory. If we hadn't put that plan together, and we had to do it very quickly in a capital that had no staff, we had to put it together in three or four days, bipartisan. It got unanimous support, including the congresswoman who voted, I guess, remotely or whatever they did. Because the truth of the matter is that if we hadn't done that, we would have had a meltdown. We would have had a meltdown in this country. We saved millions of small businesses. I am incredibly proud. It is a bipartisan achievement. Had we not done it, we would have had a depression in this country. The congresswoman likes to talk about helping people. She's never passed a bill. She's never passed a single bill. She's been in Congress for over half a decade. She's never passed a bill, not PPP, not anything, not a single bill she's passed has ever become law. I'm proud of the fact That's we saved true. millions of jobs. I'm proud of the fact we did it in a bipartisan way. That's not true. Congress I know the senator, look, and, and I'm really disappointed in you, Marco Rubio, because I, don't, I think there was a time when you did not lie in order to win. I don't know what happened to you. You know that is not true. My first term in, this, in the United States House, I passed legislation to help law enforcement officers with mental health programs. Your first term in the Senate, you voted to turn Medicare into, basically to abolish it, and then turn it into an underfunded voucher program. And then you gave the biggest tax break to the richest of the rich and said you'd pay for it with cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Run out of time, I'll give you 30. No, no, this is an important topic. So number one, and we'll fact check it. I'm gonna put it on my website now and all of you can love, the media loves to fact check. There is not a single federal law on the books that she sponsored and got passed. Not one. I think she named two post offices. I've done that too. But she's not passed a single federal law. That's number one. Number two, in terms of the tax, you know what we did in 2017? Do you know why today in Florida and across the country, working parents have a double child tax credit from what they used to have? Because I single-handedly got it passed because I took on my own party, even the editorial boards had to recognize it, I took on my own party and we doubled the child tax credit. And I took on my own party, the Wall Street Journal, even corporate interests. 
So I'm very proud of my record. In the last stop 12 you there, Senator? Todd, may I respond again, to that? Congressman, yes. Uh, it, look, the senator has obviously resorted to lying, cheating, and trying to steal. But it's, it's embarrassing that you think that honoring a person who is a hero by naming a federal building after them is nothing. I think honoring a police officer who was killed in the line of duty is everything, Senator. It matters to his family. It matters to his community. It matters to his department. It matters to me. I think it's sad that it doesn't really matter. Congresswoman, to you. I, I, both of you, we need to move on. We I know, but so I did not say here. it didn't matter. I said that that's all she's done. That's all I said. That's all she's done. Well, lying on that point, that point is made. We're going to move on. And, and by that's the way, the, not the, true. the lying and the How cheating, gullible the lying will be the, the, the lying is, the now the lying is going to be fact checked. I'm not think sure where I'm cheating or stealing. On, the next Senator. topic and the question goes How to you, gullible. Senator. All right, great. In an August interview, Senator, you said, "quote Abortion is the killing of an unborn human being," and that you do not believe the dignity and the worth of human life is tied to the circumstances of their conception. You've now signed on to fellow Senator Lindsey Graham's bill for a national abortion ban. My question to you specifically is, if reelected, if your vote can make a federal abortion ban with no exceptions the law of the land, will you vote yes? Number one, I'm 100% pro-life. Because I, not because I want to deny anyone their rights, but because I believe that innocent human life is worthy of the protection of our laws. That said, every bill I've ever sponsored on abortion, every bill I've ever voted for, has exceptions. Every one of them does, because that's what can pass, and that's what the majority of people support. Now, what was before us today in Congress that you talk about Lindsey Graham's bill, that's a four-month ban, okay? That is more lenient than every country in Europe, except for two. The extremist on abortion in this campaign is Congresswoman Demings. She supports no restrictions, no limitations of any kind. She voted against the four-month, she's against the four-month ban. She voted against the five-month ban. She supports taxpayer-funded abortion on demand for any reason at any time up until the moment of birth. That's what she supports. That's the extreme position here. I have shown a willingness to work with people to save unborn innocent human life. She opposes any limitation of any kind, and no one ever asks them about that. Congresswoman Demings. Senator, how gullible do you really think Florida voters are? Number one, you have been clear that you s support no exceptions, even including rape and incest. Now, as a police detective who investigated cases of rape and incest, no, Senator, I don't think it's okay for a 10-year-old girl to be raped and have to carry the seed of her rapist. No, I don't think it's okay for you to make decisions for women and girls as a senator, I think those decisions are made between the woman, her family, her doctor, and her faith. And to sit over, or to stand over there and say that I support, don't support abortions up to the time of birth is just a lie. But to help protect the life of the mother, which you looked at that like it was just, well, kind of a, well, that's kind of a side issue. Senator, you know that you have said you don't support any exceptions. If I, but what you're seconds. saying tonight... Yeah, no, no, number one, the bill that she's attacking me on has exceptions. It has exceptions. That's the bill right now. Number two, that you want to talk about extremes, let me tell you, you about extreme, because you talk about extreme. Here's extreme. Okay? A child that's born alive after a failed abortion. It happened 11 times in Florida in 2017. It happened eight times in 2020. A child on a failed abortion, born alive. And we had doctors in America that refused to treat or provide medical care to a child born alive. And we tried to pass a law that said, that should be a crime, that's infanticide. The abortion failed, the child was born alive and you refused to treat it, and she voted against that. That's how extreme she is. And she still will not tell you, you should ask her, what limits on abortion will you support? Congresswoman? What we know is that the senator supports no exceptions. He can make his mouth say anything today. He's good at that, by the way. What day is it and what is Marco Rubio saying? I've said time and time again, and he knows it, that I support a woman's right to choose up to the time of viability. Senator, I want, before we go, yeah. I want to get back to the original question because I understand that you said you have supported legislation that has exceptions and that this particular bill that Lindsey Graham has drafted, you signed on to, does have that no, up to four months. But I asked you a specific question. That is, if you get the chance in another six-year term to vote for a federal abortion ban with no exceptions, 
Would you vote yes if it would make it the law? No, listen, I've already told people what I I don't believe that the value of a human life is determined by the circumstances. Right, I gave, it, I gave it. But the statement. law that can pass in this country, I'm interested in saving human lives. And that's why every law that's out there has exceptions, including, including the one that, that she's attacking me on has exceptions. Every law I've ever passed has exceptions. We're never going to get a vote on a law that doesn't have exceptions because that's what the majority of the American people are. And I respect and understand that. And, and that's what I support. But she's still, you haven't asked her. No one here has asked her. She still won't answer what specific limits. She's never voted I, for a limit, not after four months, not after five months. And by the way, answered. and by the way, on the issue of exceptions, I'm being attacked on a bill that has exceptions. It's written right in there. My name is on that bill. My name is on that bill. There's a reason why no bills are ever introduced without the exceptions. That was asked, because Senator. I because that can't pass without that in there, and I understand and recognize it, and that's why I have continued to support bills that have exceptions. But she supports no limits of any kind. That is out of the mainstream. That is radical. She supports letting a doctor let an unborn baby, a, a born baby born alive, and the doctor doesn't have to treat it. That's time. Another minute to you, Congresswoman Demings. Marco Rubio has been clear that he supports no exceptions, even in the cases of rape and incest. He said it time and time and time again. But what I can say to him, and I can say to Florida, we are not going back, Senator, no matter how obsessed you are with the woman's body and her right to choose, we are not going back to a time where women are treated like second-class citizens or like property. And I'll say it again, because obviously he didn't hear or he doesn't want to, I support a woman's right to an abortion up to the time of viability. So, will she, well, can you ask if she'll support a 24-week ban? Will you support a 24-week ban? Because you didn't support a 20-week ban. You didn't support... Up to the time of viability. Well, well, but when is that? That's the vague language they all give. And then they talk about the doctor and the family. Let me tell you who else is in that it's room, that abortion room. The government is in that room because she brought them in there. She wants the taxpayer he to pay for that abortion. That's government involvement. Not just to pay for I that abortion, but point, to pay for them all over the world. For a woman the and That's our extreme. girls. That's a radical. That I believe at this point we're going to move on. My watch. I'm going to ask that you both allow me to move on sure. with this well, debate. We still didn't hear what limits she supports. This next question comes from Rick Christie, executive editor of the Palm Beach Post. Good evening, Congresswoman Demings. Uh, just today, a New York Times Siena College poll shows voters overwhelmingly believe American democracy is under threat. A Washington Post analysis shows election deniers are running for office in 48 of 50 states. The New York Times poll also shows more than two in five registered voters, including 37% of independent voters, are at least somewhat comfortable in voting for a candidate who says they don't accept the results of the 2020 election. Will you accept results of the 2022 election? Let me, let me start here, if I may. Um, my mother, the maid and a janitor, uh, worked long, hard days. But I can never remember a time they did not vote. If they, or a car wasn't working, they would pay somebody a couple of dollars to take them to the polls. Why on earth would we try to stop them from voting? They were able to vote because of our democracy, the wonderful system of government that we have. No, it is not perfect. But our system of government is what allows us to be here tonight. We have to do everything within our power to uphold the Constitution, protect the rule of law and protect our democracy and protect each person's Republican, Democrats and independents right to vote. That's what I did as a police officer and a police chief. I took an oath that I would protect and serve, defend the Constitution, not just for people who looked like me or that's the time, richest of the rich, but for all people. All right, Congressman, that's time. The same question goes to Senator Rubio. Yeah, first of all, I don't know who the rich are because my dad was a bartender at banquets and my mom was a janitor, so we have that in common. And I will tell you this much. I've never denied an election, ever. I've never said a election. I'm not like Stacey Abrams in Georgia that denied her election. I've never denied an election. I think in Florida, I think in Florida, we have great election laws, but I think elections have to have rules. And Congresswoman Deming supported this effort to have a federal takeover of elections. What would that look like? You can't ask for ID. You have to ask for ID to get into her neighborhood where she lives, and that you have every right to have that. You, you, but you can't ask for it when they vote. Allowing people to drive around with a trunk full of absentee ballots, allowing people to, to basically register on the, an hour before the same day of the election, show up and vote and inject chaos. We have to have rules and we have to have laws. 
And those laws have to be followed. Florida has good election laws. And we have record turnout, like they had record turnout in Georgia, which they were out there calling some sort of segregationist Jim Crow bill. No, these are rules. These are rules that allow people to have confidence that their vote counted and their vote mattered. They're not suppressing anyone's vote. They are rules designed to make sure the system works the way it's supposed to work. Let me just get you on record here that you will support the results of the 2022 election. We have great laws in Florida, absolutely. But will you? Sure, because I'm going to win. So I look forward to supporting that. But but, (laughs) we're moving on. But but yes, no matter what the outcome is, I'll support it because Florida has good laws. They're not the crazy laws like they have in Pennsylvania and these other places. I'm going to Vicky Sachery from Florida Trends Magazine. Uh, I don't think we gave Congresswoman Demings the. I believe we're going to move. We're going to move on here to the next question, and that's Vicky's question. Okay. Six homeowners insurance companies have already failed in Florida in 2022, putting more pressure on Florida taxpayer-backed citizens' property insurance. They are now insuring more than one million properties in the state and county. As the insurer of last resort, the collapse of citizens would be a catastrophe for Floridians. What should be done on the federal level to avoid this? Who's the question for? Senator Rubio. I'm sorry. Okay. So, number obviously, this is a state issue, but here's a couple things that I would say. The first, the flood insurance program, which is critical. A lot of the people that were hurt in the storm, hurt in the storm did not have flood insurance. It, not only, we have to go back and reauthorize it every year. We shouldn't have to keep going back every year. It should be permanent. We should also reform the system. Florida actually pays more into the flood program than it takes out. You talk about the property insurance issue. It is a state issue. The federal government, you don't want the federal government involved in property insurance, believe me. Okay? But I will say this to you. We are, I believe the number is about eight or 9% of the roof claims in America. We are 83% of the roof lawsuits in America. And so what's happening to these insurers is the cost of litigation. They're saying, I'm out, I'm out in Florida. And look, I worry about it. My property insurance is up at the end of this year and other people should be worried about it because when your property insurance goes up, if you can't afford it or you don't have it, the mortgage company will force place you and your mortgage could double. So we are facing a looming crisis. I think it's something the state has to get their arms around, but I am certainly in favor of not just reauthorizing, but reforming the flood program, separate from the wind, the flood program, and reforming it so that Florida is treated fairly. Congresswoman, you have 60 seconds to answer this same question. Would you like it repeated? No, I don't, but thank you so much. Vicki, let me tell you, as the Senator works very hard to say it is a state issue, um, that doesn't mean at the federal level, we should not care about what citizens in Florida are going through and try to do something about it. Marco Rubio has spent more time at the state level than certainly any person on this stage. So it's interesting to hear him say how that's such a state issue. Well, what in the heck did he do about it when he was the Speaker of the House or serving? He's been in elected office since 1998. And insurance in Florida has tripled, and people are suffering. I sent a letter to Governor DeSantis saying, yes, I know it's a state issue, but how can we work together to lower the cost of property insurance for Floridians? Because people are suffering. We got to prepare for the next hurricane. Are we going to wait and do nothing? I asked him to call a special legislative session to talk solely about this issue. We have got to get the property insurance time, Congresswoman. Insurance Senator Ruby, I want to give you 30 seconds to rebut. Well, first of all, when I was in the state legislature, if we want to go back to that, we actually had a special session and we passed uh, an, a reform. You know who the governor was at the time? Charlie Crist, your gubernatorial candidate. I think you've endorsed him. So you should ask him if it didn't work, but we certainly supported it, it work and we certainly made it happen. So that's number one. Number two, I would say that, trust me when I tell you guys, trust me when I tell you, a federal government that struggles to deliver the mail in a regular and consistent basis in parts of this country, you don't want them in charge of your property insurance. We would be the only state in the country that's asking the federal government to take over their property insurance. Uh, Look, do I care about the issue? Yeah, I care about the issue. I'm about to pay $9,000 a year more for property insurance. That's the 30 seconds. Thank you, Senator. We're going to move on to the next question. This question goes to you, Senator. Five days ago, the Parkland mass shooter who killed 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School avoided the death penalty. That shooter and the killer who took eight lives at an Indiana FedEx facility last year were both 19 years old when they killed the killers in this year's mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde, Texas, were both 18. All used legally purchased AR-style rifles. In the nationally televised CNN town hall three days after the Parkland massacre, You said, quote, if you are 18 years of age, you should not be able to buy a rifle. I will support a law that takes that right away. 
would you still support that federal law? Now, let me tell you why that law doesn't work and why that proposal doesn't work. We had a shooter last Thursday, tragic, in North Carolina. He was 15. Where did he get the gun? He didn't get it from a gun show. He certainly didn't buy it. He's 15 years of age. We've had shootings in the state. Pulse was a terrorist attack. A licensed security guard with a permit to carry firearms extensive background check. The guy in Parkland, this killer, everybody knew who it was. Even before they announced who the person was, everybody in the community knew who it was because this guy had long problems. He'd been acting up for a long time and everybody knew it. And here's what happened. The sheriff did nothing about it. The school district did nothing about it because they didn't want to arrest kids and fell through the cracks. Even the FBI cracks it fell through. So that's why one of the first things I did when I got back to Washington is I sponsored a bipartisan red flag law styled after Florida, not the crazy one they just passed, a real red flag law that would allow the police department to go before a judge and remove your guns if they can prove that you are a danger. The one they passed allows some coworker that doesn't like you to go to some liberal judge and take away your Second Amendment rights. So I think the solution to this problem is to identify these people that are acting this way and stop them I wanna, before I they act. I want to stop you here, Senator, but before I go to Congresswoman Demings, I want to make sure that I understand that what you said in 2018 is not what you believe is the solution today. I there do not, not believe be a bad that that is, 18 or 19 well, or 20-year-old. A 15-year-old year old just got a gun, got a shotgun. But and that's killed one a bunch case. Of I just want to make no, sure. No, it's more than you, one case. But there there, one in Connecticut also involved the exact We could, same we could thing. do this all night, but I want to make well, sure that you an don't support point. that anymore. I it mean, is. It, it is an it, important. Denying point. the right to buy it is not going to keep them from doing. Here's the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue is why are these kids? Why are these people going out there and massacring people? This is the same. Because a lot of people own AR-15s and they don't kill everyone. I understand, sir. But I want to go to Congresswoman Demings for. 60 seconds. You know, the people who are the families of victims of gun violence just heard that, and they're asking themselves, what in the hell did he just say? Senator, you used the, the Pulse nightclub shooting as your inspiration to run again for the Senate in 2016. Parkland, uh, Pulse is in my district. And yet, you've done nothing nothing to help address gun violence and get dangerous weapons out of the hands of dangerous people. Florida, after Parkland, after you made promises that you had no intentions on keeping to the parents of Parkland, Florida passed legislation raising the age to have an assault weapon, passed red flag laws that we've seen 7,000 plus instances where they've been used now. To, our primary responsibility is the safety of Floridians. And Senator, 24 years in elected office and you have not yet risen to that occasion. And then when asked about it, you say something that makes no sense. All right, Congresswoman, thank you. Senator, 30 second rebuttal from you. Yeah, what, what makes no sense is that we're gonna actually pass laws that only law abiding people will follow and criminals will continue to violate. The truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, that Americans have a Second Amendment right to protect themselves. They have, and, and, and these killers that are out there, if they're intent on killing as they are, they have found multiple ways to get a hold of weapons and cause mass destruction. Just the other day, he used a shotgun, which wouldn't have been covered by any of these restrictions. I have a bipartisan red flag law sponsored with Senator Jack Reed. But the problem is that the leftists in the, in the Senate and in the House, like, Senator, like Congresswoman Demings, are against it because they want the California red flag law that allows your right. coworker has a grudge against that's, you and can go to a judge and take away your guns. That I'll never support. That's the 30. I'm going to overlook right. Senator Elect Demings. We're going to just blow by that. Congresswoman Demings. Yeah, thank you. Look, every time we talk about responsible gun ownership and, resp and legislation that could help protect lives, you pull the Second Amendment out. My father was a gun owner has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. This is about taking dangerous guns out of the hands of dangerous people. And the overwhelming majority of people in our nation want us to do just that. How long will you watch people being gunned down in first grade, fourth grade, high school, college, church, synagogue, a grocery store, a movie theater, a mall, and a nightclub, Congresswoman, and do nothing? That is time. I want to give you 30 more seconds, Senator. Well, everything she's for would have done nothing to stop any of these shootings. Every one of these shooters would have passed the background check that she keeps insisting on. No one here is in favor of, of mass shootings and violence. And that's why she says we did nothing. That's not accurate. 
The truth, today, you go to the Department of Homeland Security website, and there's a clearinghouse. She's going to mock it. She shouldn't, because the idea came from a Parkland father. And there's a clearinghouse there that basically tells schools, for example, this is what works for safety, and this is what doesn't. And we got that put in there. You know who's trying to take that down? The Biden administration. Because they say that to have a school safety clearinghouse is discriminatory Next against time, minority Senator, students. 30 That's more seconds, Congressman. The clearinghouse is fine. But Senator Rubio thought that he could reduce this very critical issue to supporting a clearinghouse on the Homeland Security website. And he thought he would get a pass for the mass shootings that we've had in our state and doing nothing significant to do anything about it. Your primary responsibility, Senator, is to protect the safety of the people that you represent. We just passed the bill they wanted and there was a shooting a week later and a, a week after that. Why don't these we just stop work. arresting we murderers? Are, the only people that follow these laws are law-abiding citizens. Candidates, a rapist, we are out of a time robbers. on this issue, and in this half of this debate, we reached halftime, oh, and it God. is brief. So everybody stay tuned. We have many more issues to get to. You are watching Decision 2022, the U.S. Senate debate for Florida. Palm Beach State College, 90 years of preparing top graduates who are industry leaders across Florida and the nation. Find your power at Palm Beach State College. Knowing how, when, and where to vote is more important than ever. That's why AARP created the Florida Election Guide, so you can stay informed and make your voice heard. Do you want to help our neighbors in need from Hurricane Ian? Donate to Volunteer Florida's Disaster Relief Fund today. The James Madison Institute has remained the conscience of Florida's leaders and a champion for hardworking Floridians who have made this state what it is today. Governor Leroy Collins brilliantly navigated our state through turbulent times. The Leroy Collins Institute at Florida State University exemplifies his legacy, proposing bold public policy solutions. We're here in good times, tough times, and especially when it's time to rebuild. We are Florida Cities. The Everglades Foundation, restoring America's Everglades through science, advocacy, and education. WPBF 25, the Hearst-owned ABC affiliate serving the Palm Beaches and Treasure Coast, is proud to present this historic debate to help educate Florida voters. Okay. You don't get... <laughs> Welcome back to our debate for U.S. Senate here in the state of Florida. I think we can all agree we touched on a lot of very important emotional issues, and there are many more in this half hour. Senator Ruby, I want to direct this next question to you. This week, the Biden administration changed its policy. Now Venezuelans who crossed the southern border will be sent back to Mexico and banned from ever applying for asylum in this country. Do you support that? You mean Joe Biden just instituted Trump's return to Mexico policy? There's more to yeah. it, but it's, it's well, the ban on every plan. That's exactly what he did. Look, Congresswoman Deming says that what's happening at the border is nothing unusual. We have 5,000 people a day crossing the border. You know how many people have entered our country illegally since Joe Biden took over as president? Five million. You know how many have entered this country just in the last 12 months? Two million. Eighty of them on the terror watch list. At least, according to the most generous numbers, at least 1%, meaning 20,000, was serious criminal violations in their record. No country in the world, I no one has done more on the issue of Venezuela than I have, and Cuba, and Nicaragua. I sympathize deeply with everything these people are facing, and I blame Maduro for that. But there's no country in the world that can tolerate or permit or afford 5,000 people a day arriving at your border, saying the magic words, and getting asylum. And she says that's not a problem. She says there's nothing unusual about it. This cannot continue. It has to be fixed. 
He needs to, not just to do that, that needs to happen with everyone that's trying to come across, or we're going to have 10,000 people a day coming, and we can't afford, no country in the world can tolerate that. That's time. Congresswoman, I want to give you, uh, this is not a rebuttal, this is the entire 60 seconds as we continue this discussion, and I want to ask you about solutions. Specifically, what solutions do you have for solving the crisis at our southern border? We are a nation of laws. I've enforced them for 27 years. Despite what the senator wants you to believe, he's living in fantasy land. I've enforced them. And we need to make sure that the men and women at the borders have the resources that they need. I am a fan of boots on the ground. Let's have more boots on the ground, but let's also hire more processors so that we can separate those who need to be arrested from those who are seeking asylum. We're a nation of laws, but we also, we have to enforce the law, but we also obey the law that says people who are in trouble can seek asylum in this country. And so more boots on the ground, more technology, more processors, let's secure our border. The senator likes to talk about open borders. It's almost an insult to the men and women who are there securing the border, but let's get more agents to help at the border. We can do this. If I may respond to that. Number one, the only one who's insulted the people working the border are Joe Biden and Democrats who accused them of whipping Haitian migrants and that turned out not to be true. Number two, she opposed the border wall. She supported this thing called the People's Budget, which I call the Crazy People's Budget because it had a bunch of crazy stuff in it. Even Charlie Crist voted against it. And that absolutely zeroed out and banned border funding. She talks about more processors. I want you to think about what that means. What that means is now when someone crosses the border, turns himself in, claims asylum, they're usually held in detention for two to three days while they process it. What she's arguing is, let's hire more processors so we can get them through faster. So we can push people through instead of one day to three day detention, Let me stop no day there, detention. Senator, this can't ask, continue. We have to stop Let's this. ask the Congresswoman to respond to that. You have 30 seconds, Congresswoman. If we have more processors and they don't meet the standard for asylum seekers, you send them back. Yes, we need to secure our border more. I think we can do that with technology, more boots on the ground, and more people to process those who need to be turned back, those who are breaking the law, from those who are asylum seekers. Senator, enforce the law, but also obey the law which as boots, well. Which boots does she want on the ground? She was against National Guard deployment. They have demonized the Border Patrol. And they talk about processors. Who, who are you talking about, Senator? Well, your party. Who demonized the... You have, and your party has, That's Congresswoman. Absolutely look, true. Look, and let me look, tell you something else that they've done. Look, Here's the other thing they've done. They talk about more processors. Would you be willing to do anything to win, Senator? They talk about more processors. Okay, so people... Everybody... <laughs> is, the just, Biden administration... All you have to do is say the magic point, word. I, you're making it up. At this point, this, no, this look, is devolved. I want to move on to the next the issue here, Senator. The traffickers give you the magic words. You say and they let you in. More processors I am forced to move on at this time. How gullible do you think people are? The next question is going to come from Vicky Sessionary from Florida Trends Magazine. Vicki. Representative Demings, last year you backed legislation that increased Social Security benefits and were, would require highway earners to pay more in Social Security taxes. Why should Congress raise taxes to pay for a broken system? Well, number one, we have to think what the, about what the promise of Social Security was. It was to keep our seniors out of poverty. And you know, being in elected office and the critical position of being a United States Senate, Senator, it is about making choices to protect people. I believe that we've got to do everything within our power to protect those who have had to go to work every day and deserve to be able to retire with dignity and respect. Governing is about priorities and Social Security and protecting it is a priority for me. I'm not going to sacrifice this, and we need to do what we need to do, whatever that is to protect it. We can do that. Follow-up question for Senator Rubio. Uh, Florida's junior Senator Rick Scott proposed 11-point plan to rescue America requires, quote, all federal legislation to sunset in five years. If a law is worth keeping, Congress can pass it again, Senator Scott says. That includes Medicare, Social Security, and VA benefits. Do you support putting these federal entitlements on a chopping block every five years? No, and that's not my plan. That's Senator Scott. He's doing a great job. He's not very shy. You should ask him. He's more than happy to talk to you about his plan. I can tell you, on the other hand, if you want to talk about radical plans, Congresswoman Deming supported a radical plan. I already mentioned earlier the people's budget. Let me tell you the other gems in that budget. It raised $9 trillion of taxes. 
$9 trillion in taxes. I already told you about the $10.25 uh, tax on a barrel of, of, of oil, which would have meant a 35 cent increase on the gas prices you're already paying right now. Let me tell you what else it did. It zeroed out the war on terror. It took a billion dollars out of the Pentagon. This is crazy stuff. The, and that's not a plan. She voted for it. She didn't just put her name on it. She actually voted for the crazy people's budget, a socialist budget. She voted for it. I don't even know if she remembers she voted <laughs> I for it. I hadn't seen the socialist budget. Well, you voted for the people's budget, <laughs> and it's a socialist budget. Socialist, Trust me when I tell you that any budget crazy, that zeroes out the war on terror, Marxist. takes a, billion, a, tri a trillion dollars out of the Pentagon, okay, raises taxes by eight, billion, eight trillion dollars on working Americans, is a socialist budget. And, and she didn't just go, have Senator, her name on it, Senator, she Senator, voted for your it. Time. That's your time. Congresswoman Demings, 30 seconds to Senator, you. Senator, you're repeating yourself again. We've seen this show before. Socialists, socialists, crazy, Marxists, silly. Well, which that one must be on your list for your talking points. Um, the bottom line is you said that Rick Scott's plan, it's, it's good to have good ideas. You did not say that you did not support it. I, I hear you saying that tonight. But when you were first asked about his plan, you said, I think it's good to have good ideas. You remember that? Congresswoman, Senator, you can respond. Yeah, that's Rick Scott's plan. Uh, he can defend it. He can talk about it. Her name was on that The question people's was, budget. what do you think the about people's budget, I, The people's budget had her name on it. She was not just a co-sponsor two years in a row. She voted for it. There's never been a vote on Rick Scott's budget. She voted for this thing. Eight trillion dollars in taxes, eight or nine trillion, I can't remember at this point. What's another trillion, right? Um, you talk about all the other things that were in there. A $10.25 tax on a barrel of oil so that your prices go up by 35 cents? I don't know what word you prefer, socialist, Marxist, crazy. I don't know. I'm open to suggestions about Congresswoman how Demings, such I, a nutty idea Senator, that that's your the time. Congresswoman Demings. He's talking about the barrel of oil again. Senator, yeah, everyone's talking Senator, about the barrel of oil I mean, these days. I mean, look, you've been in elected office in Florida for 24 years. And what we have been left with is skyrocketing property insurance, lack of affordable housing, health care gone through the roof. We haven't expanded Medicaid. People are hurting. And you know what, Senator, when I talk to your voters around the state, you know what they say? They don't know what you stand for. All right, Congresswoman, that, that's your time. And I'm going to move on to the next. We've spent a little amount of time. I thank you both. I know this was had a lot to, to uh, discuss, but let's move on. All right. Congresswoman, this is going to go first to you. President Biden says the world is closer to nuclear Armageddon than at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis exactly 60 years ago this month. Three times in the last week, Vladimir Putin has ordered Russian missile attacks on Ukrainian cities, targeting and killing civilians. If Russia next fires a limited-range tactical nuclear device at Ukraine or strikes a NATO ally like Poland, even with a conventional weapon, what's the correct response by the Biden White House and NATO? Well, we have to hold those who are not our friends accountable. And, Senator, that does include Russia. It's not just China. Russia has attacked our Ukraine, what they, our, our friend Ukraine, what they thought was going to be over in a few days, as you know, has been gone on for almost a year. We have to continue to support Ukraine and our NATO allies. Of course, we've got to hold Russia accountable. We always use diplomacy around the NATO table. We cannot afford to have a nuclear attack. And the United States has to do everything in its power to prevent that from happening. Senator, same question to you. Well, on the first point about Vladimir Putin, I was against Vladimir Putin before being against Vladimir Putin was cool. I mean, and, and I remember that very well because Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration tried to reset relations with him. Now, I'm not sure the president had to do it over again. He would choose the words Armageddon or Cuban Missile Crisis. But there's no doubt about this. Vladimir Putin is losing this war. And if he loses the war, he'll lose his position. And, you know, I don't think the retirement plan for former Russian dictator presidents is a very good one. So I think he's very concerned about that. So I do think we have to be very wary, and I've warned about this from the beginning, about what he might do to escalate. One is the use of a tactical weapon, which is not a strategic weapon. We're not talking about him launching a missile against Chicago or New York, but we are talking about the use of artillery shells and, and short-range missiles in the battlefield, which would be unprecedented. And I think the response to that has to be a unified response that perhaps takes out 
where did this, that launch those and where those were launched from. I think the likelier scenario, and the one that really is concerning, is that he would attack, for example, an airport in Poland. At that point, NATO would have to come together and decide whether they're going to invoke Article 5, and the United States needs to live up to its NATO commitments. Let me ask the Congresswoman, to that point, the NATO response, we know what the NATO charter says, Poland's attacked, as the senator's scenario says, perhaps the airport. What is the response from the United States as well as NATO? We have to do everything within our power to protect our NATO allies. Everything within our power. If, if Poland is attacked, then there has to be an immediate response. And I believe between our military and the Department of Defense and our experts and our intelligence community, based on the intelligence on the ground, I believe that that response will be sufficient and swift, but we've got to leave it in the hands of the people who are there and the people who are involved in this every day with the ultimate goal of keeping America safe and keeping our allies, our NATO friends safe. All right, Senator, I have 30 more seconds. Well, just to add, I think the response needs to be proportional. And that, what I mean by that is, that the NATO alliance will have to meet, and this can't be unilateral, the NATO alliance will have to meet and decide what is a proportional response, and that would depend on the nature and level of the attack. But it has to be an allied response, not simply a US one. That's what's most critical here. It's not anything at our disposal, because we're not talking about the use of strategic weapons or starting World War III, but there needs to be one. I would argue to you tonight that they've already attacked NATO, because the Nord Stream pipeline underwater that supplies Germany from Russia has been bombed. It was bombed. And everyone's wondering, I saw a news report, well, they're saying Russia may have done it. Well, who else did it? Se Luxembourg, Senator, Belgium? Senator, can you wrap this up in 10 seconds? I need to move on. All right. We good? Yep. All right, I want to go back to Rick Christie from the Palm Beach Post. Rick? Uh, Congresswoman Demings, uh, Senator Rubio has called Democrats' attempts to pass a new federal voting rights law an effort to, quote, ram through an election law to make sure you never lose power to make it easier for Democrats to win. Why are new federal protections of voting rights needed? Well, let me say this. Uh, I'm not the person standing on the stage who supports suppressing the right to vote. Look, I can think about the words of my friend and former colleague, John Lewis, who said the right to vote is precious, that is almost sacred. And the senator thinks that we should leave that up to the states. Well, we try that with voting rights, and we know the bad actors who did some ungodly things to stop people from voting. So we should not just protect the right for a few people or the privileged few. We should protect voting rights for everyone. And we need a federal law to keep everybody accountable. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is sitting in the Senate right now waiting for a vote. The Freedom to Vote Act, which will help protect the right to vote for all people is sitting in the Senate right now waiting for a vote. That is our duty and responsibility to allow the people to vote. That's time. Rick, I know you have another yeah. question. Uh, this question is for you, Senator Rubio. In January, you wrote in The Federalist that Democrats' push for voting rights is about, again, quote, exaggerated problems and imaginary fears, unquote. Can you give us specifics on what you mean by that? Sure. It's never been easier Please. to vote. It's, I'm sorry? I it's didn't never hear. been easier to vote. It's okay. never been easier to vote. In Florida, you can now vote by mail for any reason. You can vote, for example, 10 days before the election. You can vote on election day. In Georgia, which they claim to be the place that was suppressing all the votes, you had record African-American voter turnout. To compare what's happening now to the Jim Crow era, where people were literally murdered, where people were forced to take poll taxes and pay poll taxes and literacy tests, what are we talking about here? We're talking about this. We're talking about, number one, when you go vote, you show an ID. I have been a Hispanic man my entire life. I'm a minority. I've never felt like producing an ID disadvantages my ability to vote. Everyone has an ID. You can't even check into a hotel. You can't buy Sudafed at Walgreens without an ID. That's number one. Number two is you can't collect a bunch of ballots. Harvesting of ballots. Cars showing up with tons of ballots sitting in the trunk of a car. Things like that that they want to force down the throat of every state in the country. We don't need that federal law imposed on every state. Florida has very good election laws, and other states have very good election laws, and the states that don't have very good election laws are the states that actually have gone in the opposite direction of weakening security for the ballot. All right, Senator, thank you. Congressman, I want to go back to you for 60 seconds. Florida has an uh, election law police force, and if the laws are so wonderful, 
Why, what's the need for that? Florida also eliminated the number of drop boxes from 2020. Why do that, particularly in certain areas, Senator? Your job is to make sure that every person votes. The ones who may vote for you and the ones who may not vote for you. That is your responsibility. So if it's so perfect, why the adjustments? We need to hold states accountable to make sure every person, although that scares the senator to death, has the right, the precious right, to cast their vote. Senator. Yeah, I've, I'm trying to suppress the vote and I'm wasting a lot of money telling people to go out and vote because that's what my campaign has been all about. Number two, I've never supported any suppression effort. Listen, we've had laws in this state. How come all of a sudden a drop box is the standard by which we judge whether people are being allowed to vote or not? We didn't have d drop boxes 10 years ago. We didn't have drop boxes in 2016 when the congresswoman was first elected to Congress. We didn't have drop boxes in, in 2012 when Barack Obama won the state of Florida running for president. That's a method of voting that doesn't advantage one group or another. There's danger involved in drop boxes. People need to think about it. Okay, imagine someone decides, oh, there's a drop box. I'm just going to put some explosive in it and blow it up and burn all of those ballots, and now those votes don't count at all. Okay, there is, there is something... With elections, there are two things that are very important. Number one, the count has to be accurate. The votes have to be counted accurately. But the other is there has to be public confidence. The public has to believe that the elections were fair and balanced. And that's what I've always been in favor of. But what they want is a federal takeover of the elections. I do not want a federal takeover of our election system. I oppose it. That's time, Senator. Congresswoman? That's nonsense. <laughs> okay. That we want a federal takeover. We pass the Voting Rights Advancement Act in the House of Representatives because of the unbelievable voter suppression efforts that were going on by the senator and his party. Well, which voter Let suppression vote people is that? vote. That's nonsense, what he just said. We want every person to vote. And Senator, we've been busy too, encouraging people that's to time, vote. It doesn't threaten me. It doesn't scare me to let the people vote. And that's time. I want to move on to another issue. We are coming close to the end of the debate. I want to make sure you both get all your time for closing statements. This is going to go to you first, Congresswoman. The Biden National Security Plan identifies Russia as an imminent danger and China as the greatest long-term threat given President Xi's comments Monday that included threats to Taiwan. What should U.S. policy be with China moving forward from here? We've got to hold China accountable. We've got to hold them accountable for the violations of our intellectual property. We've got to hold them accountable for... Uh, look, the bottom line is the United States is the world power. We are the most powerful nation in the world. We know that China has not been the best player, the best actor, and we have to hold them accountable. What President Xi said about possibly taking Taiwan by force, that is totally against our principles and our values, and we have to take action if there's any serious effort to do that. Look, I serve on the Intelligence Committee as well as the Senator does. That is something that we have been monitoring just about every day. If China makes any aggressive actions, deliberate actions to take Taiwan, then there has to be a response from the United States. Senator? Yeah, first of all, I would say that every, this is a fact, every major anti-China proposal that has been voted on in the last five years has been my bill, so much so that China has actually sanctioned and banned me. And I was very upset about that because I had to cancel my vacation in Wuhan. So, <laughs> but, but all kidding aside, the 21st century will be defined, defined by the relationship between the United States and China. We wasted 20 years thinking that once China got rich and prosperous, they would become like us. And we woke up into a world where they don't want to become like us. They want to replace us. We made one mistake. Number one, we allowed American manufacturing to leave this country and go to China. And so today, they own the manufacturing capacity. 88% of pharmaceuticals come from there. So that's why I've worked on things like bringing the pharmaceutical industry back to the United States, particularly in Puerto Rico, and I have a bill that will do that. The second thing is we have to begin to invest in our military, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, to defeat the weapon systems they're innovating. We don't need the Pentagon spending all its time producing videos on the proper use of pronouns. We need them focused on how to blow up aircraft carriers Senator, made by China. thank you. Congresswoman number 30 to you. 
The bottom line is we have to hold China. I'd ask the audience to please respect the candidate's statements. The bottom line is we have to hold China accountable. Uh, there, and your question involved their takeover of Taiwan. We have to make sure that that does not happen. And as a member of the Intelligence Committee, we are, that is an issue that we are studying every day to make sure that does not happen. Look, the senator can play um, national security expert all he wants. I know he needs that for his next presidential run. Hey, Congresswoman, the, I need to stop you there, and I want to give, because you mentioned the senator, another 30 seconds to the senator. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what she means by play national security expert. I'm the vice chairman of the Intelligence Committee and was the previous chairman of it, so it's actually my job. But the second thing I would say is I think holding China accountable, that's, that's a talking point. I get it. I'm supporting the concept. It's a great banner. I'm sure it's a good bumper sticker. But it's not a plan. I actually have a detailed plan for how you address it. And one of the things we have to do, you want to hold China accountable, fix this country first. Make things in America again. Because you think things are bad now, imagine the day you wake up and realize we can't get medicine because the Chinese have cut us off. And then we can't get gas because they I need have to all cut the you off, Senator. 15 more seconds the to the Congress. Senator voted against the CHIPS Act. He goes around the state talking a lot about our dependency on China because of semiconductors, and then he voted against the CHIPS Act. That would help further America's independence. And that is time for both of you because you're going to get your, it's a gift, full time for closing statements. Senator Rubio, floor is yours. Well, thank you for hosting this debate tonight. I'm glad people got a chance to see that elections are about a choice. Look, I've been in Washington now for two terms in the Senate, and in the two terms I've been there, no U.S. Senator has gotten more done than I have. Today, parents in Florida whose child have pediatric cancer will have options because I took on the pharmaceutical companies and passed the bill that forced that. The child tax credit double because I passed the bill that did that. Veterans that, had, that were exposed to toxic burn pits will now get treatment at the VA and not have to fight with the VA because we just passed the bill that I sponsored all these bipartisan to make that happen. And millions of American small businesses and millions of American small business jobs were saved because of a bill we passed. And so I'm asking for a chance to continue that work because I have a record of not just identifying the problems but fixing it. And my opponent has been in Congress now for half a decade and has never passed a single piece of legislation into law, not one. The only thing she does is vote 100% with Pelosi. The vote is clear, and I'm asking voters for their support. Thank right you. Right on time, Senator. <laughs> Congresswoman Demings. I thought I wasn't going to start my closing arguments with the last couple of things the senator said were just not true. And, and let me say this. I stand on this stage tonight as a daughter the daughter of a maid and a janitor. Had the awesome honor of being the first in my family to graduate college, served at the police department, worked my way up through the ranks to become the chief of police, serving in the House and now running for the Senate. Only in America is my story possible. I just happen to believe that every person, regardless of who they are, deserves the opportunity to succeed, deserves the opportunity to make it. The senator will pick and choose winners and losers based on their ability to pay to play. He talked about pharmaceuticals. He voted against legislation that would help reduce the cost of prescription drugs and help cap the cost of insulin. And that is time. That is time. Senator, Congressman, thank you both so much for participating in this. We want to thank our audience across the state of Florida and on the internet right now for this. This will also be broadcast, rebroadcast on C-SPAN. Election day is November 8th, and early voting begins next week. Thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs>